Welcome to Leslie's People and uh, the painting we're bringing alive this week is Norman Baker. Uh, Norman has been uh, uh, for a long time the MP uh, locally but he had a career outside uh, of politics uh, and an interesting one at that. Uh, Norman, uh, one of the things that we know about you is that uh, you are a, a digger for information. You're a terrier and you were very key on the very strange case of Dr. Kelly. This is 2003 and this was the famous government, soon to become famous government scientist uh, who was involved in uh, uh, working on uh, illegal chemical and biological weapons, uh, not just for Britain but for the world. Um, and uh, he was then roped in to the government's tissue of lies, which we had, the false documents, the do dodgy dossiers, which were produced to justify the Iraq war, which misled Parliament and led to the deaths of countless British soldiers and a great many more Iraqis in what I regard as an illegal war. And Dr Kelly, who was an expert in these matters, had significant doubts about the uh, veracity of these dodgy dossiers, which were in part written by Alistair Campbell, uh, made that plain to Andrew Gilligan in an off-record discussion at the Charing Cross Hotel uh, in London um, and then uh, well all hell broke loose because Andrew Gilligan used this information in a broadcast early on in the morning on the Today programme. Um, the government then went into um, full overdrive and Dr Kelly was forced out, his name was forced out. Well then subsequently, very shortly afterwards, he was found dead in the woods. Curiously enough, that's a phrase he'd used about himself um, some months earlier. He was found dead in the woods in what were suspicious circumstances. However, within um, a, a couple of hours, literally, of his uh, body being officially found, um, a public inquiry of sorts had been established under Lord Hutton. Uh, Lord Hutton had been uh, identified as the right person by uh, members of the government. Uh, he had been spoken to. He'd been found in his office in the House of Lords on a Friday morning, most curiously, because nobody's there on a Friday morning. Um, uh, his terms of reference had been agreed and the whole thing was then announced by lunchtime. Well, of course, uh, that meant that the uh, sense of the press was directed towards this so-called inquiry which was due to take place and away from Dr Kelly's death. And the inquiry, I use the word lightly because of nothing of the sort, um, when it took place, largely focused on the government and the BBC uh, and poor Dr Kelly got barely a look in. Now, when this was all happening, I thought, well, you know, why is nobody looking at the, the death? This is, this is a man who has died in suspicious circumstances. And we still have to tell you, 18 years on now, uh, nearly 18 years on, there's been no inquest. This is absolutely disgraceful in this country. Whatever you think happened to Dr Kelly, everybody who dies in suspicious circumstances is entitled to an inquest. There's been no inquest on Dr Kelly's death. And apparently, uh, nobody seemed to be that bothered about it. So. In 2005, 2006, when I saw the way the wind was blowing and that nothing much was happening about Dr Kelly and I looked into matters, I was contacted by a number of doctors who said it is clinically impossible for Dr Kelly to have died in the way that it was described. And the more I looked into it, the more distasteful and suspicious the whole matter became. The so-called Hutton inquiry uh, was nothing of the sort. It was a non-statutory inquiry. That means that nobody was there giving evidence under oath. Uh, nobody was compelled to come and give evidence at all. The key police officer investigating uh, the death didn't appear or was never mentioned in the inquiry. Uh, Dr Kelly's best friend, Mike Pedersen, who knew all about Dr Kelly, was not invited to give evidence. Um, people who were giving evidence didn't do so under oath. Uh, a whole lot of um, uh, contradictions arose in the limited evidence there was. Uh, at one point, I think it was the uh, pathologist was asked, um, would you regard the uh, death as, uh, as likely to be suicide? I think that was roughly the question. And, uh, and he said something like this, I don't have the exact quote in my head. It's consistent with suicide if you ignore all the other facts. So what did, Doctor, what did Lord Hutton say to this? Did he say, what do you mean by that? No, he said, thank you very much. That was the end of the evidence. That's the kind of inquiry it was. So. Uh, what I do in my what I did in my political life, Keith, was I went round looking at elephants in rooms, and I said, "There's an elephant over there. Why is no one talking about that elephant?" And nobody was talking about it. And I think the the press 
really failed lamentably in this whole episode. They didn't look into it at all. What's their job? They're journalists. They should investigate matters. They investigated nothing. They led. They were led by Alistair Campbell, and they followed his story absolutely. And uh, the great thing about 2003 that really shook me was the incompetence of the press, because they failed to do their job properly, and the government got away with it. And at the end of it, as you know, Gavin Davis, the BBC chairman, resigned. Greg Dyke, the director general, resigned. Uh, Andrew Gilligan was pushed out of his job as a reporter, and yet they were all basically right. And who resigned from the government? Nobody. Now, uh, it, obviously, the, uh, uh, the powers that be swung into action very quickly, and uh, it, you know, whether the press was lamentable or not, they obviously were subject to pressure. What pressure were you subjected to? Oh, well, I mean, um, I, 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 as soon as I decided to write this book uh, on Dr. Kelly, um, uh, I invoked the Daily Mail, and the Daily Mail was very supportive. Uh, it ran stories with me, it finally serialised my book, including, I think, two front pages of the Mail. And I did that, not because um, it, was, it was just useful to do that, but I did it because it gave me some protection, because if you've got the Daily Mail on board, then people think twice about what they do with you. So it was a measure of protection. Um, so the Daily Mail was very supportive. Um, and uh, I got, I think, I've forgotten how many it was, several thousand emails and letters from constituents and non-constituents right across the country, mostly non-constituents, including about 50 who offered new information, including about 15 who were connected with the police and security services, who were happy to tell me things. Um, and I met some of those people. It was a very interesting experience for me, apart from anything else, to do that. But you know, in terms of what I had, um, that minimised it, I think. But I had, um, I had um, an episode in my office just around the corner from here, actually, just, um, just along the road, when um, one day uh, my office manager's computer, which was the main computer in the, in the office, came up with a uh, uh, suddenly came up with a notice saying your your uh, computer was having its files deleted, and within ten seconds, it completely completely dead. Um, I got the police involved in that actually because that was quite serious. They had no idea how it could have happened. It was investigated by the police over at uh, over at um, um, not Farmer, just beyond that. Um, I forgot where the police headquarters are, just beyond there, but the special headquarters there. So you did have there. things go bump in the night, didn't you? Well, I, I, um, you never quite know where things go bump in the night, or whether you hear things. I mean, I like to try and stick to things I'm definitely sure about, and I'm definitely sure about the computer. You uh, had a very distinguished career in Parliament, and uh, when you were quite a young spud, you set some sort of record, which uh, always makes me chuckle. Well, I set the record for the most written questions, um, and I asked, I asked more questions, I think, in, um, I think it was three weeks, and Tim Rathbone and asked in 23 years or something before, I can't remember that figure. I mean, to be honest with you, I probably was um, not as selective as I should have been. I had so many things I wanted to campaign on when I got elected and so many things I thought were wrong and wanted action. I was hugely enthusiastic and I just went at it all guns blazing. And I think in retrospect I should have been slightly more selective, but you know, that was, that was a novelty and the enthusiasm of a young new MP. Um, but yes, I mean, I think um, parliamentary questions were and are a very underrated tool. They're a way of getting information out that, uh, written questions this is, that um, otherwise don't appear. And particularly before the Freedom of Information Act came in, it was really a bit the only way you can get information out of the government of the day. And if people say, well, written questions aren't terribly important, it depends what they are. Because, for example, one of the questions I asked, which was terribly effective, was I asked the government to list the percentage increase in cost of travelling by variously road, rail, air and uh, bus over the last 20 years. And what this showed was that the cost of Travelling by public transport had risen enormously, and the cost of travelling by car and air, which of course are the more polluting methods, had decreased significantly. Now, that was the first time that trend had been shown, and that was then used heavily by me, by Greenpeace, Frontier, and everybody else to demonstrate that the government's transport policy had changed. And it did change a bit, and I think that question was helpful in that. And of course, the question which was I'm most famous for, which I got awards for actually, was. Um, uh, related to Peter Mandelson and the Hindu passport affair. And if you remember this, there was a Millennium Dome which he was responsible for, which I 
was a Lib Dem spokesman, which was wonderful because it was like having the open goal every week to score. Um, people just passed the ball in front of the net and you banged at the back of the net every week. And um, he was in charge of this. He hated me, Peter Mandelson, and uh, I thought he was uh, a malign influence in government, so I went for him. Um, and he wouldn't come to the Commons and answer questions, so I bombarded him with literally hundreds of written questions. It's the only way he can get, make the guy accountable until I forced him to come to the Commons and answer questions, which I did. Um, uh, anyway, one of the questions I asked, not him, but Jack Straw, who was a Home Secretary, was about the Hinduja passports because he'd wanted to get sponsorship for these various zones in the dome, if you remember. The whole thing was a white elephant. And uh, one of the zones was a faith zone. And of course, nobody really wanted to sponsor the faith zone. Um, anyway, I mean, he suddenly came up with, uh, I think it was a million quid from the Hinduja brothers, who are very rich Indian business people. And um, I, I then did some research, and to cut a long story short, uh, I discovered that um, there'd been some, uh, I think, improper behaviour where he'd helped accelerate their passport applications in return for the million pound um, donation. So I asked the question of the Home Office, of Jack Straw, what representations he'd received from Peter Mandelson about the Hindu passports. Uh, it's always helpful to know the answer to a question when you ask it. Um, so I put this question down, and then was, uh, it turned out subsequently, um, I found out from the Observer actually, there was a huge row in government about this question because Mandelson didn't want to answer it, of course. And Jack Straw insisted it was answered. He took the line that um, it was a perfectly proper question that was come from an MP and he should answer it. Now, it may be he was, a, he was approaching it in a, in a genuine way, or maybe he didn't like Mandelson, it was quite helpful to him, like, who knows? Anyway, the upshot was that his junior minister, Barbara Roche, did answer the question. And um, at that point, um, I was in Germany on Commons business, and uh, I got the message through, he'd had to resign. Blair had told me he had to resign. Um, so I got besieged on I spent most of my time in Germany on the phone <laughs> doing interviews about this question. I remember coming back about two years later and um, going into the BBC at Millbank. And um, the BBC doesn't organise itself in necessarily a very efficient way. And I got this bunch of you know, media vultures suddenly landed on me from BBC Norfolk and BBC Devon and whoever else it was, all wanting separate interviews. Well, they couldn't just have one interview and pull it, I don't know, but they wanted separate interviews. So and that was an extraordinary experience. And I got out of that the um, Opposition Politician of the Year Award from Channel 4 and the Question of the Year Award from The Spectator. And uh, all because of the written question. So the power of a written question should not be underestimated. Uh, as a veteran, you turn to transport and uh, you have become something of an expert on transport. How do you see transport in the future? What's going to happen to the way that we actually travel? My prediction may be different to what I want. Uh, what I want is a revitalisation of public transport because I think it's, it's good for the environment to uh, maximise the number of people in the vehicle above anything else. And uh, I also think it's good for the economy because um, it's, um, it's cheaper ultimately to transfer people by train or by bus and it's by car and in overall towns. You, you, you minimise congestion in the high street if people are coming by bus. A bus can hold 75 people. That's potentially 75 cars causing congestion. So I want to see a, a renewal of public transport. I also think we should see more cycling and walking because it's good for people to, to do that. And socially, I think we should mingle with people um, ideally, you know, you should talk to people on buses and trains. People don't always do that, but sometimes they do. I think it's quite social to do that. And people behave slightly oddly sometimes when they're in this little box of theirs called a car, when they appear to be separated from the rest of the universe. And uh, they're both on their own and not on their own. And, and they behave perhaps in a way they wouldn't do if they were on a bus or a train. So I think for all sorts of reasons, I would like to see walking, cycling and public transport um, come into its own. Um, and when the virus first hit us in about March, <coughs> we did see from the government um, some sensible policies. We saw an attempt to encourage cycling and walking, which did increase dramatically. And by the way, people want to cycle. We've got one of the highest um, percentages of bicycle ownership in this country of anywhere in the world but one of the lowest uses. Why is that? <clears throat> it's because people want to cycle but don't feel safe doing so, I think.
largely. And people did feel safe when there were fewer cars on the road in March. So if we can get back to that stage, we can, we can have that. And if you look at Holland, if you look back to Holland in the 1980s or thereabouts, it was chock-a-block with cars. Now it's everybody's on a bike in Holland. Uh, you can transfer these skills and this, this attitude. So I'd like to see that. But unfortunately what's happening now is that um, the government sent the message out in March that public transport wasn't safe. Um, I suppose it was sensible to try and discourage that at the time until we knew what was happening. But public transport now is safe. People are, are, are um, uh, uh, entering vehicles which have been scrupulously cleaned regularly. They're wearing masks, they're socially distanced. There's really no reason why they shouldn't use a bus or a train. They're probably a lot safer than pubs and clubs and everything, which are still open. And yet people have got this mindset that it's not safe. So the consequence is that we're having a car-based recovery now, where car traffic's back to where it was, and public transport use is well down. You know, that's not sensible, actually, in longer terms. So where at, what my prediction will be will depend upon whether the government deals with that or not. Um, <clears throat> if they do nothing, then we will, we will end up with public transport going back 30 years. We'll end up with cars everywhere and a lot of congestion. Uh, but the government needs to lead on this. It has a decarbonisation strategy, which is good. Uh, it has supported the rail and bus industry in the last few months in a very positive way, better than many countries. But it needs to make that leap now to, um, to get people back on buses and trains. And that's something I'm working on in my hat with, with the campaign for better transport, where I advise among transport policy. So we'll be having a campaign on that very shortly to try to encourage the government. You know, as far as the transport secretary is concerned, um, Grant Chaps have done many good things, actually. But I worry that um, he seems to think that green cars are the answer to everything. Well, green cars are welcome insofar as they take away um, pollution, but they don't take away congestion. And uh, they also leave people isolated for those who haven't got access to cars. So he needs to actually think about those two things. I'm not sure he has done yet. Uh, a final question, Norman, uh, um, because you've given us a fascinating background to a number of things, is uh, you actually were associated with the Dalai Lama. Yes, I was. I, this is another one of these elephants in rooms. There was um, a reporter, Jonathan Mursky, used to write The Observer, and he used to, this is before I was an MP, and he used to write these columns about Tibet, and I thought, this is terrible what's happening in Tibet. This is effectively genocide. And I used the word advisedly, not carelessly because the Chinese government has illegally occupied Tibet, is rewritten history or trying to rewrite history to say it was always there, which it wasn't, um, and is carrying out a policy which is designed to eradicate the very nature of Tibetan beliefs, uh, their religion, their culture, to force Han Chinese culture on them, to turn them into Han Chinese. That is genocide under the definition of the post-war definition of genocide. And I couldn't believe this was happening, no one was doing anything about it. So I took up the issue of Tibet, um, one of those issues I took up when I arrived in Parliament in 1987. And I ended up then uh, as president of the Tibet Society um, for about 10 years. And as part of that, obviously, uh, I met the Dalai Lama on a number of occasions, both in England and in India. And um, I have to say, one of my, my most nervous moments ever in life was when I was the host to the Dalai Lama uh, when he came to give an address at the Albert Hall before, I don't know, 50,000 people or something. And I was the host of that and I was doing a and a with him. And uh, this is me and him on this huge stage. And a translator, I think, behind us in case. He speaks English quite well, but he has a translator just in case. And I was incredibly nervous. I don't get nervous in front of 50,000 people. But I got nervous because I got a lot of respect for him and I wanted not to get it wrong. That's why I was nervous. Um, and he is a peculiar character in the sense that you don't quite know what he's going to say next. And he's got a very infectious laugh. And he doesn't really behave as you think a sort of religious person should behave. <laughs> um, so I mean, that was, a, that was a, a challenging moment for me. I think I got away with it, but I was, I was quite nervous with that. But he is a tremendous figure, and you know, the Chinese call him a terrorist. Good God, how this word is misused. He has dedicated his life to non-violence and to peace. 
he's like a you know an equivalent of Gandhi in a way. I mean, uh, you know, how to call him a terrorist? It's just it's just outrageous. And at last, the world now is beginning to wake up to the horrors of the Chinese regime. Um, and they've gone, they've overreached themselves, of course, with Xinjiang and the Muslims and all these concentration camps, because that's what they are, they're setting up. And they've overreached themselves very visibly in Hong Kong, where they've, they've torn up the agreement with the British, which should last 50 years and doesn't last 50 years. And um, they're showing contempt for the world, actually. And at last, the world begins to wake up and say, we can't let this carry on. They've let it carry on for ages. You know, the deal with the Chinese was that um, the West thought, Given the Olympics, 2008 was it, I think, give them the Olympics and uh, that will expose the world to the China, China and China to the world and, and the economic uh, advance the Chinese has made will be matched by democracy catching up. Well, of course, nothing of the sort happened. What the Chinese have now got is an absolute control of the population, which is unbelievable. Um, it's worse than Orwell's 1984 in terms of capacity. They will now know everything you're doing, they monitor everything you do on your mobile phone, everything. Then CCTV's everywhere. Um, they've now given points for, um, for how you behave. If you, if you walk across a red light as a pedestrian, you get points deducted. They know you've done it, they'll deduct points. And if enough points are deducted, they stop you travelling by train. They stop you chilling you into university and all these sorts of things. They force you to behave exactly as they want, as robots. This is the future of the world if we're not careful. And that's what's happening in China now. Um, they've, they've occupied um, Tibet illegally. You know, the British know about Tibet because we were there. We were going around the world and forcing people to trade with us. <laughs> that's what it was. I mean, we, we shouldn't have done that in a way, the way we did it, but at least we weren't kind of massacring people in the way the Chinese do. We went into Tibet and we forced them to trade with us. But we actually got on quite well with him, and Dalai Lama likes the British. He was there, of course, because he's now very old. Um, and um, we were there. We were the only country really in Tibet um, before the Chinese invasion, to any degree. So we know they were independent. They had their own government. They had their own currency. They had their own stamps. They had their own foreign policy. Uh, we signed treaties with them. You know, the, the similar convention, 1914, and others, which the Chinese are not part of. We did bilateral treaties with the Tibetans, so we know they're independent. So when the Chinese turn around and say, it's always been part of China, what absolute nonsense. I mean, it hasn't been. They cannot re be allowed to rewrite history in this way. Uh, people do like re right to rewrite history in totalitarian regimes. There was no joke in Soviet Russia um, under Stalin when Russians would say to each other, we don't know what's going to, you never know, you never know what's going to happen tomorrow, was the line they used to use in Stalin's, uh, no, that's not right. You never know what's going to happen yesterday. That's right, you never know what's going to happen yesterday, is what they said, because the history is rewritten by Stalin. So thanks for being with us. You're and welcome. there we go, Leslie's people. <laughs> <laughs> Norman Baker, thank you for being with us. Uh, once again, a very lively character and one where the life of the portraits that Leslie Hills paints has come to life uh, in the streets of Lewis.